The World of Conoco, a disturbing psychedelic trip filled with gore, violence, and sex that will ravage you from the inside. Spoilers ahead. The film begins with a quote by a French poet Jean Cocteau. An error is only confused by a confused mind. The quote pretty much sums up what you're about to experience. Everybody is confused about everyone and what they know. You can't trust the characters as there's no reliable narrator to clear the air and volatile editing doesn't help at all. An important thing to point out is that the movie split into two timelines, the present and the past, so you jump between them all the time. Let me try and dismember the plot first, and I will start with the present. The lead character, Akikazu, is an ex-police detective who lost his job and estranged from his wife Kiriko and daughter Kaneko due to his alcoholism and anger issues, so you are here for a ride. <laughs> He suddenly gets a call from his ex-wife, who says that their daughter has been missing for several days. That's how Akikazu embarks on a journey to piece together an image of his daughter he never truly knew. He searches her room and finds drugs in her bag. He immediately assumes that she's become a drug addict and is probably hanging out to her friend's or boyfriend's place. And oh boy, is he wrong. He talks to Kanako's friends first, who don't seem to care about Kanako's whereabouts that much. You can hardly call them friends, but you get a sense that they know much more than they're telling. Akikazu becomes a little bit aggressive with his interrogation, and the girls run the fuck away like they should. Stranger danger. Next stop, Kanako's psychologist. Akikazu not only finds drugs in his daughter's room, but also an anxiety prescription. However, that lead doesn't get him anywhere because doctors can't share confidential information about their patients. Nonetheless, you understand that Kanako went through something pretty traumatic for her to seek help. With such a father, no shit, daddy issues, here they come. Akikazu ducks deeper and meets with Kanako's ex-girlfriends from middle school, one of the worst periods in a lot of people's lives. Akikazu shows them the pictures he found in Kanako's room and the girls spill the beans on some of the classmates. Ogata, a Kanako's friend who committed suicide because of the bullying, Nami, a drug addict who wasn't able to get out of it, and Matsunaga, a guy with a dangerous reputation. That scene reminds me of the spot the main anime character meme. Akikazu meets up with Kanako's teacher to gather more information about those classmates, and apparently the school knew about the drugs and did nothing. Exactly what the schools are for. <laughs> the dad takes matters into his own hands and looks for Matsunaga himself, and that doesn't end well as he gets captured by the Yakuza. And that's when you finally get a full picture of what Kanako was like as a person. So let's rewind a bit and talk about our main female character, Kanako. Kanako didn't have an awesome childhood, that's pretty clear. The first traumatic event that kick-started her descent into the darkness was related to her dad. One time, he almost choked her to death. It's also lightly implied that he raped her, which actually happens in the book the movie is based on. The second traumatic event is linked to her friend Ogata, who she was in love with. Ogata was kidnapped by Matsunaga and his gang and raped by old men, some of which were high-ranking men, like government officials and the police and Kanako's psychologist. Hi there. After Ogata's suicide, Kanako befriended the gang in order to get revenge. No idea how it went fucking south and what kind of revenge Kanako had in her mind, but she became the most hard-working member of that group. Yet other kids into the drugs and inviting them to the parties where they would get raped. These acts were documented with photos, some of which Kanako eventually stole. Kanako is described as an angel-like girl who is liked by everyone. Guys fall in love with her, girls want to be friends with her, or want to be her. She draws you in by saying what you want to hear, but she can completely destroy you. Basically an ideal pimp. She herself sleeps with clients, I guess you can call them that, or pedophiles. Pedophiles is the better word. And she's fully devoid of any emotions. Her heart is empty. Like in a lot of Japanese movies, she laughs maniacally from time to time. <laughs> Her last victim, a boy who is being severely bullied, reminds her of Ogata, but she still goes through with the plan and even lets him get killed. Still, her dad is, by far, the most fucked up character. Alcoholism and anger issues aside, he's very delusional about his relationship with his ex-wife and daughter. He daydreams about a perfect family you see in commercials, and he wants to fix things, but he does it in the most messed up ways. An example might be raping his ex-wife and thinking that after that, she would want to start over and give your relationship a second chance. 
Akikazu gets a hold of the photo of Skanika's stall and learns a lot about her from the Yakuza. They also reveal that because the police are involved in the whole pedophile prostitution ring, there is a cop named Aikawa, recently turned hitman who is roaming around killing Kanako's criminal friends to cover everything up, so maybe he has already got his hands on Kanako. The Yakuza provide Akikazu with a gun and send him to Aikawa's home. Such nice and helpful people. There you get to witness another rape scene and at this point you cannot wait for Akikazu to burn in hell. But you also want to know where the fuck Kanako is. He takes Aikawa's family hostage to meet with Aikawa himself. The plan is to trade. Aikawa lies and says that he's got Kanako, he just hasn't killed her yet. Obviously, it's a lie, so the super bloody fight ensues. The police arrive on the scene, but Akikazu escapes. The movie is quite fast-paced. It's in your face. Flashy images, jumps in time, gore. You don't have time to take a deep breath and think about the plot and all the characters you're introduced to. Where's Kanako? Is she dead or alive? If she's dead, then who killed her? You have to circle back and go through all the people again at some point. That's what Akikazu does. He returns to the teacher, the teacher you've seen briefly at the very beginning. Akikazu realizes that the teacher's daughter was on one of the Kanako's photos and that she likely killed Kanako in revenge. The teacher admits to it and you get one last flashback of how it happened. It happened with a screwdriver. She used a screwdriver to kill a kid. Akikazu forces the teacher to find and dig up the grave she buried Kanako in, because he refuses to believe his daughter is dead. However, this task is impossible to accomplish due to a recent snowfall. Akikazu grabs a shovel and starts digging through the snow himself. The film ends as he vows to kill Kanako with his own hands. Akikazu will live in internal hell for the rest of his life. We have two unhinged women in this movie, Kanako and her teacher. On the scale of unhingedness, Kanako is almost off the charts. The movie doesn't go deep into her side which is a shame. She's almost portrayed as a psychopath with her lack of remorse and emotions in general. Her relationship with sex is not normal for a 17-year-old. She plays seductive games with not only her classmates, but older men and women. You can only assume that the reason behind her ruining the lives of the other kids is because she's been assaulted herself. The movie kinda pushes the narrative of the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Kanako is the product of her father. I like to think that at the very end, Akikazu realizes what his violent nature has done to his daughter. In a way, her murder is on him. Maybe he didn't get a chance to kill her with his bare hands, but he killed her with his actions, like a butterfly effect. This is something he can't comprehend, as the only language he knows is physical violence. Kanako's teacher, on the other hand, evokes sympathetic responses from the viewer. Nobody condones revenge murder. She could have done so many things, get public attention, talk about drug abuse at school, but she chose violence like all the other characters, just to feel a little bit better. The only difference is that you can justify such an act to a certain extent. You clearly see the motivation behind it and feel sorry for all people involved. On the scale of unhingedness, the teacher is totally there. As she continues to work at the same school like nothing happened and seems to be not bothered by ending a person's life using a freaking screwdriver. Maybe in the book this character has a deeper arc. As I've mentioned, the world of Kanako was based on 2004 mystery novel called Endless Thirst or Never Ending Thirst. The book was initially considered to be too lurid for a mainstream film adaptation, but a Japanese director, probably one of the most provocative Japanese directors, Tetsuo Nakashima, read it and decided to write his own script, which turned into a movie. The name actually remained quite the same, just Thirst, but for the English-speaking people, the movie became known as The World of Kanako, the title which doesn't fully reflect the movie's ideas. It makes you feel like the main protagonist is Kanako, while in reality it's your scumbag dad. Being a fan of unsolved mysteries, the author based his story on a couple of real crime cases that happened in Japan in the late 90s and early 2000s. The first one being the Petty Angel case, about child prostitution. Back in the early July in 2003, three teenage girls were hanging around Shibuya Station in Tokyo. A man approached them with a job offer of some sort, to help him clean his apartment for 10,000 yen, around $100. The girls agreed, but when they all got to the apartment, the men tasered and handcuffed them to the gas tanks in separate rooms. Before the criminal kidnapped the girls, he had sold off his two Ferraris and terminated his apartment lease. He purchased the gas tanks along with charcoal and some grills. When the police started searching for the missing girls, the men committed suicide through carbon monoxide poisoning. One of the girls noticed that everything got quiet and managed to free herself. She ran out of the apartment to seek help at the nearest flower shop. 
all the girls were rescued and reunited with their parents. This case has left a lot of unanswered questions and sparked a lot of theories. The criminal was from a wealthy household and he went to a prestigious university. But the members of his family had some issues. For instance, his father and brother committed suicide and his mother was depressed and said to have attempted suicide as well. After graduation, he worked at host clubs and then started his own illegal date club. Basically, prostitution ring, trafficking underage girls, one of them being the Petty Angel Club. This club became very successful. The perpetrator hired high school girls to lure in victims and distribute flyers, promising girls money for different services for clients. It was revealed that it was a members-only club and that there was a large client list. There are many rumors about who was on that list. Politicians, judges, movie producers and doctors, you name it. Along with the list, the police found video recordings of various sexual acts. The case is very sketchy. Police closed it pretty fast. Nobody knows why the criminal committed suicide said in such a manner and who else helped him or was involved with the whole prostitution ring. In BuzzFeed Unsolved words, the case remains unsolved. The second real crime case that echoes in the movie is the Hachi Oji supermarket massacre. In 1995, again in the month of July, three female employees, two of which were teen girls, were found dead in the supermarket in Hachi Oji city. Each had been bound with tape and killed with a single gunshot to the head. In the room there was a safe containing over 5 million yen with a bullet hole in it. The victims didn't know the combination to the safe, so the police described it as a failed robbery attempt, which can be true, however the execution style of the murder makes it a disturbing and suspicious case. It still remains unsolved to this day. The movie is not ideal, and ending violence gets tiring. The movie could have been better at exploring its female characters. But all in all, that shit was quite crazy.